Thank you. Delighted to be here this evening to uh, share with you uh, some of the thinking, some of the process and some of the great cases, um, not just in the UK but abroad as well, in terms of citizen engagement. So what we're talking about today in terms of citizen engagement is really how uh, the government uh, use digital uh, channels and social media to either broadcast or discuss with the public um, uh, issues that are pertinent uh, to themselves and how they can do, you know, better government, um, a little bit of open democracy, as well as kind of getting service delivery right for everyone. Um, so I've got about a talk that I've prepared for between about 40 and 45 minutes. It's got a bunch full of examples in it. I'm sure um, I will be happy for you to um, uh, have that afterwards um, or they'll be able to kind of post it on any of the resources. So um, just really as a show of hands before we, we start, which would be kind of useful and interesting um, to know in terms of context. So can I ask you who here works in uh, a government, a local government um, organization? There's a few of you here today. Great, thank you. And then who of you here works in industry and business? A few of you here. I think we had a few kind of students um, in academic organizations. Great, okay. Thanks, that's really helpful. There'll always be a bunch I've missed out. I'm very sorry about that. Is there anyone who stands outside of all of those three things? No, okay, we've got everyone. Good. So what I want to do is kind of bring this alive for you in that kind of context and share with you some of the examples, but then what it might mean for all of us. So this is largely, you know, what, what we've been doing and working with in central government um, in terms of citizen engagement as a case. I have spent 80% uh, of the last decade, eight out of the last 10 years, um, in central government. Um, very early days from the no one had email and no one had uh, the web uh, as an access point um, to looking at the evolution of putting information online and broadcast and then working in the advent of social media. So I've been in an office environment in central government in many different departments looking at how we use it. Um, I had the great pleasure to work on uh, direct gov um, from its first institution um, uh, as its first communications director. So direct.gov.uk is the government's main uh, one website and one tone of voice um, to be able to talk to the public. It's been replaced, I think, just three months ago with gov.uk. Uh, I was part of the team that launched data.gov.uk, so the open data provision. I had the great opportunity uh, to work with Sir Tim Berners-Lee and the head of artificial intelligence in the UK, Professor Nigel Shadbolt, as part of our project team. So some awesome brains, some world authorities on you know how uh, digital and its engagement, and uh, then became the first head of public participation. Government thought the term social media might just go away uh, when we first looked at it. So um, we d we're conscious not to put ourselves in a box and just call it social media. We call it public participation because we foresaw it is wider than just uh, social media itself. So public participation covered uh, ways in which we can do open consultation and co-collaboration of policy making. Um, so that's some of the examples I want to share with you um, today. I'm going to share with you a little bit in terms of strategy and governance and setting it up and then the seven levels of digital engagement and then examples for each of those and what, what they meant in terms of case studies. Um, and that's what we're going to go through. So there's about a 10 year history in uh, the documentation that's driven uh, the changes for the UK government. I've documented all of those in the last slide. So from sort of early 2002 to at least 2009, the major uh, government policies that looked at and sort of changed the way in which we operated in the UK. The first of which here is that blue document in the service of democracy, you know, came out in 2002 um, to look at how we interact. Um, a, a huge project over a couple of years, Subsequently to that was transformational government, um, so uh, a way in which that we wanted to be able to change and shape government to enable better service delivery and digital. And I guess one of the most um, powerful pieces was the Power of Information Task Force report. A, a, a group of individuals were charged with looking and getting a, a critique of government in terms of what it should be doing, and they produced this report. And I gave around um, uh, 18 uh, points that government responded to um, to be able to address the way in which government needed to change. That document in the government's response formed... Um, 
uh, the team that I came to work in. It created the advent of the first digital engagement director in government um, who I worked with. And um, when we started, just three of us working in the back of cabinet office in sort of 2009 to help with the social and digital agenda. So um, three people in my team, one looked at open data, one looked at collaborative tools. So how can civil servants work better together across um, different uh, physical and cultural boundaries in the UK to work on uh, you know, shared subject matter like health or transport that might span a couple of different government departments, as well as then my role, which was looking at how do we do um, open engagement and how do we use social media to good effect. And at the time, there were pockets of government already using um, social media um, and practitioners in a lot of different government departments. So we came in and looked at how we then strategically had to move forward. We'd had, as digital had grown up within government, uh, a couple of ways of looking at it retrospectively and learnings from that. I was part of the project team um, that looked at the uh, largest uh, web rationalization project um, at the time in the world. We closed 95% of government websites over five years because the web had happened and every department and most brands within departments had just kind of popped up websites um, to focus on a particular issue. And we kind of inherited then this web estate that some were obsolete or out of date or people couldn't find or weren't well surfaced. And I imagine many of you in organizations, you know, and particularly in large organizations, have that issue now. Now I'm working with organizations that have to uh, do that piece of work and deliver that piece of work on social channels where different parts have set up different named Twitter account or Facebook pages and need to pull that back together. So we're seeing um, rationalization of um, you know, social uh, pages and social platforms already. So three main kind of policy drivers, if you like. Our Department for International Development had a policy driver to showcase to the British public where the money was being sent, spent. It had an obligation to uh, showcase if they're rebuilding a town in Bangalore, how successful that was, or uh, showcase imagery around it. Um, the Foreign uh, and Commonwealth Office had a whole agenda around digital diplomacy, as they called it. They're one of the very old traditional networks in the UK that had um, uh, bloggers within different country environments telling the story of what was happening in different um, uh, uh, British offices abroad. And then the Ministry of Defence over some of the positioning of the uh, UK troops in Afghanistan uh, felt a little bit um, disenfranchised from the British public. So they wanted to see how they could use social and digital to kind of tell some of the good news stories that were happening about there. So some of the you know paperwork and some of the drivers um, in the government agenda that kind of forced the hand of us all getting better a little bit at digital. So in terms of strategy and governance, everything that we do must uh, originate from a strategic standpoint. I can't uh, kind of labor the point enough that everything must um, start with your objectives. And sometimes uh, people get excited about a new tool or a new application and then think retrospectively about how that must work for them. And actually the position that we always took is, what are our objectives? What are we, what are we trying to do? Who are the audience? Um, uh, and which are the channels of which uh, we can reach them on. Are they there? And it's not digital for digital sake or social because it was shiny. It was really um, an objective-led position. So there's some... We, we worked in a historical environment where um, we've been very used to traditional media. So those pictures on the left represent kind of TV and direct mail and PR. Um, the uh, government department I worked in uh, used to be called the Ministry of Information um, and then became the Central Office of, Inte uh, of Information as um, uh, 60 years history of broadcasting to the British public TV advertising um, for the for the sake of the nation and encouraging them to not drink drive or um, you know uh, public health and safety information so a terribly institutionalized kind of broadcast environment albeit advertising and marketing led so we had the opportunity to look at how we create that shift here's a model by um, David Omano that um, we quite liked at the time and he talks about traditional marketing and then you know the medium around that 
And then a term that he uses, trad digital marketing, is not something that I tend to uh, to use and I haven't seen much outside of his presentations, but actually just great to be able to say, you know, when that early digital story started, looking at banners and microsites and emails, and that's some of the facilities for it. And then moving forward into social engagement and what we meant by that, networks, communities, blogs, micro blogs. Our, our early work was, you know, pre-Twitter and er, very early Facebook. We set uh, three pieces of documentation that help support not just governments but, uh, or civil servants, but businesses um, to be able to use social media in a business context. So those three pieces of documentation are a code of conduct and the five simple statements here are the UK government's um, uh, code of conduct. It's the behavioral wish list of who you really wish your employees or um, your participants um, from your organization would behave, be credible, you know, be transparent, be consistent, be an ambassador for your organization are um, uh, the code of conduct that the UK government have. The second is a uh, policy. Now, different people call policy guidelines, all of uh, these different terms, if you like. But a policy should uh, leave you in no doubt about what your employees are able and not able to do on social media. Because we've had situations in the UK where policemen have been sacked for the use of Facebook. And if they'd lived in another district where the use is more sophisticated, what they would would have still done is it would have been more acceptable practice and it wouldn't have been a sackable offence because in different district they might have had a more sophisticated use of social media. So our employees and um, people who work with us sometimes see a policy as a restriction where actually it should be to protect your brand as much as your employees. If you've got really clear guidance, um, your employees know what they can and can't do and are more likely to encourage to put messages out on social spaces. People need to know that during work hours, can they use their own laptop for personal email, uh, for personal uh, Facebook or social media? Can they use their work laptop out of hours what are they allowed to download in speeds? These are all quite granular things that will help enable people to know what they can and cannot do. And then the third piece is guidance. So how we use social media here, how we use it within um, the environment of which we work in and the, the, the channels we use, the platforms we use and the way in which it's appropriate for us to use are the kind of three pieces of documentation um, we uh, put together in the government and the uh, the result was it was a tome, it was a great big directory. So you needed to break it up and make it palatable. Um, so we had some uh, smaller guides produced. What does it mean for press officers? What does it mean for internal communications? What does it mean for the marketing team? So that people could um, get used to it and, uh, um, and not having to look through a very stiff, um, uh, large directory. So there's some sort of documentation that helps people. But actually, even before you start, it's a great idea to always consider what might, must m might go wrong. Um, this is kind of the prenup of social media. It's looking at um, the uh, rebuttal process or the crisis management process or the what do you do when someone says something you don't like on social media? It's good to have that in advance. So this model that I've shared with you is actually the American Air Force. And it came out before we started using social media. And in the UK government, we adopted it in almost every government department. And now I work with agencies, uh, me media agencies, digital agencies in the UK. And a lot of them use this model. Even the social media agencies evolved from um, this base. So I thought it'd be good to share you the origination. So it talks about the fact that um, somebody has said something about you online. Um, is it positive or negative? Is it negative? They put it into one of four categories. Now use this as a platform to develop your own should it be useful for you. But is, is it the result of a bad customer experience? Is it wrong what they're saying and you need to redirect them or signpost them? Is it because they're doing it as a satire or a joke? Now there are three very different responses that you would do to, to um, you know, that potential engagement or what someone said about you online. So all this is more than anything is, is a process that might be useful for you to develop your own processes um, but it's the kind of base that that most agencies um, take things from crisis communication it, particularly in social hadn't raised his head as much as uh, in the last two years we've seen the horizon oil spill crisis we've seen the pressure that Greenpeace have put on um, certain brands of confectionery and the noise they've made on on, on social spaces about campaigning against them and um, you know, the, uh, some of the things that BP were held up for um, in the Horizon oil spill crisis in the Gulf 
was about different people saying different messages to the press. So the first rule of kind of crisis communications is is get your facts straight. Get your facts straight. Organize who in your business is going to be, you know, talking to the media well before it happens. Tell people what's happening. You know, take responsibility where it's due. This doesn't mean necessarily claim responsibility. So you don't have to say, it's my fault, I'm sorry. You have to say, you know, uh, take responsibility, say then we'll look, we're looking into it and we'll give you the appropriate um, information. Tell people what you're going to do and do sort of some clear principles that we put into place. So have a process for it. And then we um, coined sort of seven levels of um, engagement, which is kind of the meat of the presentation today that I'm going to take you through in terms of um, what we did in under each of those headings, if you like. The first thing we did is kind of establish a way in which we could communicate in, in what we called a walled garden. We needed a safe online space that people in central government could communicate with people in local government about what they were doing in terms of digital engagement. We didn't want the press um, or the public to have a look at that. It's not that it wasn't open and transparent, but while you're evolving your thinking with your peers, you need to be able to discuss that in a in a working environment that's closed. So we started um, uh, a, a group on communities of practice for local government that was already started. Um, it it uh, quickly had traction. It had 500 you know, digital practitioners in central and local government it, as part of that group, posting which events they thought were worth the money going to, where they learned things um, that were pertinent to their role, who had a particular strategy, what strategies they borrowed from other organizations, just that kind of working environment to be able to help inform their thinking in a, in a safe space. And we evolved the seven levels of engagement. So I'm going to take you through um, those just now after a short swig of water. So the first one, disseminating. So this is from early. So th you'll be doing a lot of these good things already. Um, one of the thir first things I wanted to be able to show you, uh, you know, who's interested here in kind of infographics? People share kind of data visualizations. You've got the opportunity when things are designed really well in one page to be able to take meaningful insight and meaningful content from them. They're really useful if you want to get your information out to journalists or to other stakeholders to be able to produce a nice picture with text and graphics that explain. So. Not many times in infographic do you see the before. So I've got the before and the after to show with you. So this is the before. This is the public expenditure analysis from 2009. You know, you can't compare it, can you? It's a bunch of PDFs. You can't, without looking down into it, see which department uh, had the most spend. It would take a long time to do that. And even if you did do it, um, they would be in charts and it would be a bit of a job to compare it. Until the bright people at The Guardian built this. This is uh, the one-page bubble gram on public uh, spending. So taking the whole of public spending, breaking it up into departments, the size of the bubbles, opposite um, reference, the size of the spend and the size of the agencies um, uh, and their spend that are attached to those. So you can very clearly see in one neat one-pager the whole expenditure within government and the government departments. We weren't the first to do it. The US did it first. I think those are still online. They call it death and taxes. Um, and that's been kind of produced by external people um, and showcased that. But uh, infographics are a very great way to be able to share in that broadcast disseminating way of getting good information out. So here's a, a couple more that were on the Treasury website. So we wanted to be able to break down information that people could search for. And searching for people and searching for dates, um, you know, perhaps doesn't create the, the, the prettiest picture. So um, working with digital agency uh, to be able to demonstrate um, a, a neater way of people being able to find that information is just one of the ways of disseminating. And then... Um, these uh, websites have evolved so much more since, but this is a classic kind of screen grabs that I took um, at the time of uh, a neat way of just being able to, on the homepage, send your Twitter updates, your um, news feeds um, uh, uh, from your own website itself. Uh, the Scottish government there, I've got podcasts, so any government announcement, they were just breaking up into audio files and publishing. And then certain government departments started their own kind of Flickr, um, community photo sharing, and um, some of our community sites uh, were having uh, ministerial talks filmed just by the press officers trained in those little neat kind of flip video cameras that came out a couple of years ago. Just some good practice of going around, 
good, you know, broadcast-ish quality, but it's more about capturing it than kind of producing shinier content to be able to do so and just publishing that on the YouTube channel. So you have these. So ways of being able to kind of, you know, break up information into different media that's more appetizing for the public. And then some of the other uh, organizations uh, within government uh, set up social bookmarking. So Delicious being one of those facilities. This is a department for uh, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs at the time. Started there. You can just save this to Delicious if it's useful and interesting for you. And other government departments had their own uh, Delicious feed um, that other people socially could search for things that they'd tagged or other people had tagged that were useful and personal to their organization. And then some of our um, earlier uh, adopters, I guess, kind of the first um, government departments that wanted to use social media or had some great content from it. Um, here you'll see Diffid in the Foreign Office are kind of the two, uh, two of the leaders in government of producing information, starting um, you know, Twitter feeds and uh, Facebook feeds. We had an issue in the UK government where um, the Foreign Office were using Twitter just to post which countries were safe to go to or not. It's a very useful resource in the UK. It gives immediate and updated status of if you're traveling, um, uh, what's the country status in terms of you know, uh, uh, alerts and safety for tourists. And it's a very traditional service that they just decided to use Twitter that we know social should be open and engaging. And they used it just uh, for broadcasts for that to start with, which was uh, absolutely ideal. Um, and we had an issue where we had to look at, during a period of PERDA running up to a general election, closing communication channels to keep the airways free uh, for political endeavor, which happens running up to every general election. It was the first time we had social and I had to write the guidance for the very first time that said, no, we can't shut off Twitter <laughs> or our Twitter feed particularly of that um, because people still rely on this information and it's not crowding the airwaves for it. And we had to the very first time look at that digital information and what it looked like and what was allowed to still happen in a, in a period where you're supposed to clear the airwaves um, and social was still allowed in making those cases for it. So then looking at kind of monitoring and insight and um, uh, some of the tools we use are still available today. They're still free. So iGoogle, is anyone here an iGoogle user? Um, yeah, some of you. So uh, I think they're getting rid of it in November 2013, which I'm gutted about. Um, uh, it's a very useful tool of being able to put into um, the blank space that sits around your uh, Google search bar any other things that might be interesting for you. This is the Ministry of Justice uh, press office uh, monitoring iGoogle page from a couple of years ago. Um, they decided to use one Gmail account, uh, people be able to press officers to put the feeds in that are useful for them. And you can see on the right hand box starred content. So all the press officers are looking at it, favoriting the content that's most pertinent to them that day. And you've got self filtering of your peer community in that space. A couple of other organizations uh, within government looked at that. So this is um, DCSF, the Children's Schools and Families Department. They used uh, a colored and uh, branded NetVibes feed, netvibes.com. Again, a great service that does automated um, aggregated filtering. Department for Work and Pensions had a much more heavyweight solution. They used a product called Moreover, and it actually looked at the, at the content as well as the uh, political or ministerial agenda. And you could sort it by blogs, videos, microblogs, wikis, and really drill down into the content. So, you know, a range of solutions. Cabinet Office, we built our own. But this was about three days of a developer time um, to be able to put a neat dashboard together to filter. But I guess my favorite example in all of this is what we did in COI. We built this again as a tailored NetVibes feed, you know, three years ago, social media monitoring hadn't grown up like it has now. But more than anything, um, the reason that this was implemented because of what we were measured during swine flu. I worked within the UK government when swine flu happened. Um, we set up netvibes.com, uh, swine flu, we kept it open to the public so they could um, see what we were monitoring um, if, they, if they so wanted to. But we, took, we looked very hard at the search terms, so the government called it national pandemic flu vaccinations and people were searching and, and commenting on swine flu jabs. So we had to kind of change the, the terminology. Only 
by listening to social media? Did we find out that pregnant women were concerned about the effect of the antiviral injections on their pregnancy? And only by social media did the volume of comments warrant us to change our information immediately on direct gov, NHS choices, um, and um, the Department of Health website so that people could get the information that they needed immediately. And it was one of the big leverage cases we had. Um, so if we can take away anything from this, one of the first stages, um, if you're not involved in a, a broadcast or engaging fashion for your business or organization is listen. Uh, listen and help yourself build those insights that can help drive your strategy. So in the responding and discussing, you know, some of the early executions were quite simple. We allowed people on the website to have their say, and we might have enabled that by forums or blogs or al al allowing them to uh, interact on the site. Uh, with the advent of DirectGov, we made it much more specific. So you'll see here how to report a crime or antisocial behavior and how they can do very specific things in just that one way, first of all, responding mechanism. We executed... Um, uh, campaigns on uh, different digital and social channels. As far back as 2007, we gave cameramen in the front line uh, video cameras so they could take a day in the life of um, their life. We actually, at the time, it was kind of pre-neat video cameras that were portable, had the rushes sent back, cut, and put onto kind of the early executions of YouTube. Um, as that grew up, we had um, the opportunity to put, you know, put a Bebo site up. It was kind of pre-Facebook, looking at RAF recruitment. We were looking at servicemen um, in our Air Force and how they might get more information and uh, driving the recruitment aspects. And, and Bebo was the uh, place to put that information at the time. We built community on there. We've got people forums on there, open moderation, people asking, um, that's great, that's interesting, where should I go to sign up, which is what we were trying to drive to. So we've been doing that historically and breaking it up onto different channels in that endeavour. And then some light discussion in other people's established communities. Net mums and mums net have half a million members. And, uh, you know, if you had half a million mums meeting in the park and you were an organisation that provided services to them, particularly as the government, you want to be part of that conversation. So traditionally, we always ran prime minister's web chats. Any um, policy that came out in terms of affecting benefits or affecting work or uh, affecting the way in which the government supported them, we got people's opinions on that site to feed into the policy making. So on different sites outside of government, here's another one that BBC run for disabled people. We'll always make sure that disabled people consultations were run in conjunction with kind of key stakeholders. And then some sort of, you know, going through, uh, still disc discussing and responding. There's a kind of neat application that still um, exists on Lewisham websites, the City Council. They enable you, if you have a pothole, a hole in your road um, that annoys you, you can take your smartphone out, take a photo, and it gets uploaded and GPS tagged to where it is onto the map. And the council can look at that map, fill in your pothole that you have on your tag, and you can revisit the website. Or actually, you'll see it because it's the one that annoys you outside your front door. <laughs> um, so just that light two-way um, discussing and responding. And then um, a more recent endeavour, so Red Tape Challenge. We recognise in central government that uh, there's a lot of administration for small businesses. And actually, how can we get rid of that? Or how can we make it more palatable? Or, or what can we need to do? And what are the issues? So the Red Tape Challenge is how can we cut administration for small businesses to encourage entrepreneurship in the UK. Number 10, historically, have the, uh, the site of the most engagement. People who can't find uh, what they're looking for will head there as a lion site to um, go out to other organisations. So they have a kind of acronym for all of their social channels, which is Steffi LPST. The other site, Twitter, email, Facebook, Foursquare, Flickr, YouTube, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Storify, and Tripline are the um, social channels that they use um, to be able to kind of engage um, uh, with the public in terms of the messages they're using. And here's some of them here. So moving on to a more consultative fashion, up the kind of deeper level of engagement, if you like. Um, we have e-petitions in the UK. It's been a traditional way in which the British public can start any petition they want online on this space, and uh, number 10 has sight of it. So anyone can put a petition up. If it has 100,000 signatures, it gets debated in Parliament. We had an issue where we have a very loud and sometimes 
obnoxious motor journalist called Jeremy Clarkson. He's incredibly popular um, with motorsport enthusiasts. Um, there was an e-petition started, Jeremy Clarkson for Prime Minister. <laughs> and it got quite a weight of votes, but didn't quite get enough of 100,000 to be debated in Parliament um, at the time. So it shows you anyone can um, put anything together for that. And then we've got the opportunity for open consultation on site itself. So um, this is the Department of Health. They're having a consultation about kind of adult autism and they've got the opportunity uh, for people to comment on the site. The second example is Mumsnet. So uh, one of the larger um, communities serving um, uh, parents and particularly mothers. So if there's a government consultation, they encourage people to go to the right place to sign up or actually hold parts of the consultation on there. But actually, one of the greater evolutions is um, using, uh, we used a product called Commentariat at the time. Um, it uh, works on a similar basis to WordPress, where you can, um, uh, as a blogging platform, comment on all different parts of it. So consultation documents used to be PDFs, they used to be downloaded, they were kind of weighty tomes. This time, we had the opportunity to use uh, new tools to break up each paragraph. So not only could people um, put their comments, but they could see everyone else's comments related just to that paragraph. So that you've got a really uh, flexible way of being able to comment and view a consultation. We set up a Twitter account and we tried to engage with the community to help put it further out to encourage different people. Um, and we also set up a whole system of feedback just on the system itself. Um, the reason that we did this is we're trying to get people to understand um, to uh, the, the issues that we had in the cost, quality and usage of government websites. So what we were charged with doing as a team is working out a new system. So one department might um, measure their website on visits, another unique users, another on hits, another on dwell time. And we couldn't compare you know, how much they cost with how, how many visits they had and was it working for the public. So we decided to implement a new system. And to enable us to do that, we knew that whatever system we decided within the, you know, walls of Whitehall, there'd be people who said, I wish you'd, I wish you'd asked, I wish you'd asked us. Or people who said, I'm not sure that I think you've got the best method of doing that. So we wanted to break this up, not just as a, isn't it great to get open policy consultation? We wanted to grow a community of engaged individuals who could actually, through their own experience and knowledge, share with us actually real feedback that was important in terms of their skills transference to us. We didn't have all the answers. So... Um, that's the way in which that we broke it up. We also used a system called User Voice. If you've used any open surveys like SurveyMonkey or um, something similar, User Voice allows you to have a set of questions that people can comment, vote or rate. But they can also rate their answers up and down. So more popular answers get different rating. But they can also insert their own questions and rate those up and down. Um, and we use a user voice for this. So these are the kind of mechanisms we got to get to the uh, policy evolution. When we had the first um, uh, digital engagement director in central government, someone started a user voice survey saying, what should he do? And we didn't know how it would turn out. You know, we had to kind of watch and just see what the public um, would say within this survey. So uh, most people came back with practical solutions. But there's a group of people from Stoke-on-Trent that considered that perhaps we were using too London-centric, basing them there. So uh, got enough people to vote he should move to Stoke-on-Trent for the top score by galvanising their community. Um, and actually, you know, obviously he couldn't because of his role, but when he did his first 100 days address, he went to um, Stoke-on-Trent to kind of present there as that kind of, you know, acknowledging what they had done, which was a nice touch. So... You have the opportunity, whether you work within government or whether you work within projects, whether you work um, as a student or whether you work within business, to actually kind of open up um, and get public opinion, being with your stakeholders for projects or whether it be your public in terms of consultation. Um, in uh, 2010, I was approached on Twitter by uh, a guy who went under the uh, Twitter URL as Employee Kyle. I said, Tiffany, if you're feeling civic-minded, please would you mind retweeting this? So I looked at it. It was a WordPress site, very much similar to this, where he said he was one of the 17,000 students in the UK not able to get a job straight from university. 
So he set up a WordPress site that said, the challenge for you employers to bid for my services for two months um, and said, this is my skill set and basically promoted it as a competition for employers and just turned the model on its head. Um, uh, the Guardian picked it up and did a podcast. It got reported in 480 uh, uh, different pieces of content online. Uh, it got picked up in uh, 12 countries. Um, and he's now employed Kyle and got 12 very serious job offers and went to work for a social enterprise in New York. But the reason I wanted to share that story in the context of this is I'm telling these stories in, in you know, civic engagement, which might not be what all of us do within this room, but there are ways of using these tools um, for our own engagement in those purposes. And they're, 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 they're free and, and easy enough to learn how to use. Uh, so now the government has evolved so much so um, in social and digital kind of engagement in that, that consulting method that they're running open Twitter Q&As. This is Francis Maud, our cabinet minister. This is in June this year and the uh, civil service, head of civil service Bob Kerslake and they're having Twitter and Facebook open consultation um, on the civil service reform that the civil service is going through at this moment. And then we've seen uh, opportunities to uh, have uh, organisations either fund, co-fund or part fund uh, uh, competition ideas. So uh, this is from very early on. 2008, they asked uh, the competition, show us a better way. What would you create with better public information? So I think there was a £20,000 worth. It wasn't really prize money. It was kind of development money in terms of what would you like to make? If you think you can do it better, show us how you do it and we'll... Um, uh, be able to you know see whether we can take that on any further or not so you've got the opportunity to create opportunities to do that so moving on to kind of collaborating which is kind of the um, kind of the last and more engaging step of the digital engagement journey that we've been on <coughs> We've seen um, in the Department of Business Innovation in Schools pledge trees, which are kind of like community solutions. Essentially, it works as a just a light way of people being able to put up their position um, and then um, the neat execution is kind of birds on the tree, if you like. So put their ideas together and you create little flocks for things that are kind of more important um, for different groups together. So looking at different ways in which we can uh, get people's opinion in a visual or stimulating way. We've uh, got a few examples in terms of what the UK government did running up to um, act on Cop Copenhagen to look at what we could take in uh, to Copenhagen on the public uh, debate around greener issues for our government and that policy making. So one of the things we set up is kind of, you know, the grassroots action. What are organisations doing in local communities um, that the government can learn from um, and have a space for them to be able to put their projects in one place so the projects to give to together give a better um, weight and better uh, leverage to understand um, uh, what are the opportunities within that arena. Uh, and uh, uh, another version of that is actually uh, we were challenged with uh, the Department for Education and Climate Change working with the National Union of Students to actually develop the government's policy that they took uh, for greener issues into Copenhagen. So the way in which they, they did that is it'd be great to get students' opinion. They really wanted to uh, value that and honour that and see w what mattered to uh, students to take in. They used a programme called Mixed Inc, which instead of kind of asking people, well, you write the policy, which, let's face it, is an enormous amount of work. They used a programme called Mixed Inc, which allowed people to take different parts of policy that they liked already. So they could look at the World Wildlife Fund and say, actually, they've got a really good uh, paragraph or a couple of paragraphs here that we really like. So we're just going to borrow that, um, acknowledge and honour where it came from, as well as write a little bit ourselves. So by allowing the facility of kind of, you know, digital collaboration from other policy making through this programme, they came up with a student manifesto that went into, uh, went into the Copenhagen debate. And uh, I guess uh, the kind of biggest execution we've had of collaboration is with data.gov.uk. So delighted to be part of the team um, that launched data.gov.uk. Uh, the US had done it before us and they've done it really well. They have data.gov. The, the way in which that we uh, presented our data was in something called linked data. So instead of just publishing 
every data set, what we did was um, link those. So if you're a farmer, you could then uh, see what other data was linked to that other farms within that county. Is it dairy? Is it arable? To be able to make more sense of that data, to be able to produce things. So the premise behind it was actually to stimulate industry. We wanted to put government information in one place, and we wanted people to make things and sell them, and that was okay. Um, and uh, there's been quite a few applications that have been made um, directly from kind of data.gov. We had people looking at compare the care home, people looking at air quality, people looking at um, crime mapping, uh, bus stop mapping with uh, traffic accident mapping. So mothers could see which route was most safe home uh, to take their children from school, for example. The first data set that was released when was on um, uh, cycle routes. Uh, that was immediately mapped and they could see where the saf safest places for uh, cycling were around the roads in London. Uh, some people uh, took the data and made apps that went onto the iStore. So the most uh, famous that was the top seller for two weeks in the UK was the Asborometer. They released all the crime data in the UK and Asbo in the UK is an antisocial behaviour order. It's a ticket for being naughty. And someone got those and mapped them all so that you could see whether Doncaster had more than Manchester, for example, <laughs> um, and to hit the headlines. I'm pretty sure that the Ministry of Justice, when they released their data, it had no idea that this was being made um, or that people could make this with it. But um, it was. So um, one of the great applications that came out of that was um, uh, GovSpark. So uh, I'm, I'm part of the strategy board for, young, uh, for Rewired State, um, the largest independent ne developer network in the UK. And they have a competition every year to teach young kids how to code. They get them as young as seven and they get them mentored for a week all around the country. And they must, it has to be public sector data. And it was the kind of, you know, the first thing that Rewired State did was to create an event to show government, you know, what data could be made in a hackathon, sort of a 24 hour, 48 hour busy uh, period of making apps with public sector data um, and a bunch of developers together. So we do this with kids, they make um, things mentored all week and then they come down for a big show and tell. This was uh, uh, last year's winner, um, Izzy, 16 years old, took the energy outputs from government department, compared them and built GovSpark in the course of a week. Number 10 liked it so much, they invited her in and it still lives on today and it's still a, a funded project. Um, so uh, working with the public and working with bright developers outside of government walls to be able to create um, applications is kind of you know the higher end of collaboration that the UK government have worked on. I wanted to share with you some uh, very quickly some international examples. So um, a lot of our uh, information about how we organise social and digital and data came from America, Australia and Canada. Um, they had put um, you know, precursors down to direct guard precursors down to data.gov before we had an opportunity. But in terms of social, they were using it very well and had great social media policies, but using it a lot for broadcast um, um, so from kind of Australia uh, the States and Canada um, and they thought we were a little bit um, uh, crazy for wanting the power of public opinions um, into our um, uh, policy making if you like and looked on with kind of interest so we always had open conversations with every other government to look at how they were using it and how we could help each other we spoke to um, GSA uh, General Services Administration our equivalent of cabinet office because actually they'd gone through a general election before we had but uh, uh, so we could learn from the uh, from what they were doing or, or uh, data.gov but then um, they were looking at how we kind of galvanize communities so sharing information around that way so I wanted to share a couple of examples uh, closer to home for you about how other governments are using social and digital in that. So uh, France literally uh, just this month or last month uh, launched France Diplomatie which is a way in which that you can um, engage um, with uh, government services and uh, policy making in France. So they already have as you can see kind of Flickr, Twitter and YouTube as channels that they engage with but they've just launched this resource um, literally in the last two months um, so that you can engage with um, uh, public and be quite interested to see how this develops. I think so everyone's looking at its growth. 
Um, Spain, the, their uh, Department for Education have been using things uh, in social ways very well. So they've been using YouTube quite historically and they've had it um, for a couple of years now. And you can see they're kind of 40,000 following on Twitter in terms of how they use um, Twitter as a mechanism to uh, engage. Uh, some further channels for them. And then the federal government in Germany, they've been using uh, YouTube since 2011. They started something called a conversational debate um, where they're asking people to input directly to the chancellor through that rich video mechanism. Um, that's kind of quick and engaging. The Flemish government have been working on open data, so looking at how they uh, can release data and build better public services and quite advanced in their thinking. Uh, and Singapore started what they called um, the big conversation. So they got people together to look at um, uh, all in one room uh, issues around how they should start to organise their government services. It's very similar to um, uh, the Scottish conversation that happened a couple of years ago. Our Scottish uh, administration was all part of the British and they devolved, so Wales and Scotland then had their own administrations. And at the time, there was a... a, a good conversation in Scotland, it was called, you know, the great conversation in looking at um, what, what services should be provided for Scottish people by Scottish people and what still um, could be um, kept with um, a great resource from the kind of UK administration. So looking at open making. Um, so in terms of resources, I just wanted to kind of share that um, uh, large piece of kind of history of documentation. Uh, if any of you are interested in this or um, useful for those of you in working government in terms of from 2002 to 2009, the policy drivers that um, came together uh, to help us on our journey of where we are now. That takes me to 45 minutes and 21 seconds, which is 21 seconds more than I intended. Um, and I'd love to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, fabulous, thank you so much. Um, I was just going to ask the first question, but uh, if you would, in collecting your own thoughts, uh, make some uh, obvious and physical symbol uh, so I know who needs the microphone uh, so that we can ensure that it also gets recorded. Thank you very much. Uh, Tiffany, fabulous, thanks so, so very much. Uh, one question that is often asked of people very committed to enhancing participation through digital means is whether the means are in fact sufficiently equitably distributed as to ensure that there's equal access at the same time. I wonder if you might sort of speak to that question uh, while I look for other people to follow up. <laughs> That's okay, Thank yes, you. perfectly well. And that could be 45 minutes and answer itself, because no it is yeah. a big issue. You know, um, again, the largest statistics we were talking about this morning, sort of 10% of people are all for it, and 10% of people are kind of against it, and 80% of people generally don't mind. And um, how do we make sure that everything that we're doing isn't just by the people um, who are strong polarized advocates or detractors from what we're trying to do? And that works in business as well as, as much as it does in citizen engagement. And I had the great pleasure to work within government before digital. So there were some great practices that worked as well offline as they do online. So um, I helped run the national pensions debate. We changed the way pensions are delivered in the UK government. But we did that by taking ministers, going to cities, getting you know groups of 50 people together in a town hall and actually debating what are the four or five choices that independent reports have shown us what's most palatable and that changed policy making. So there's always been a historic good ground um, in the UK of consultation and we had to ensure that when things went digital and when things went online we're not just uh, preaching to the converted in that regard. Um, it's very easy to put things out digitally and um, uh, get public opinion and feedback but you must meter that um, and a part of that work is offline work. Part of that is ensuring that you're reaching out to people um, in the right spaces that they go to whether that's on or offline to get that, that opinion in. Um, so it is as much about in engaging with people um, to give them the opportunity to have seen and heard, not just by digital means, but offline means in terms of the promotion and the availability of that consultation. It's something we've, we've got to clearly address. Anyone wish to follow up? Thanks. Th thanks for your talk. Um, um, I have a question about how do you... Um, well, it's obviously developed the di digital participation during pa uh, past years, but uh, what is the main 
trend you see, sort of how it's going to develop, uh, uh, like, mm, like policy making, like user driven policy making, like what what it like is is there anything you see in like in the near future as a sort of a direction it develops? Um, I I get asked this question a lot, kind of what's next, if you like. Um, if I knew the answer to that wholeheartedly, I'd probably be in Hawaii. <laughs> um, but there are some things that we have seen that kind of help our opinion making. Um, you've picked a particular subject, which I'll answer if that's okay, which is in open policy making. Um, so with the advent of social media, you know, I think fund fundamentally social media has changed the way in which we communicate. You know, there is an expectation now that your organisations are listening to what people are, are saying on social. We've seen... Um, uh, two trends particularly in trust evolve in the role of um, uh, individuals within an organization who's trusted and who's not. I presented earlier today the Edelman Trust Barometer, um, which Edelman, a great PR agency, they take the roles in an organization every year globally and look at who's trusted more than not. Um, so an academic and a technical expert are the two roles that are most trusted. The third most trusted person is a person like yourself. Um, and kind of NGOs and then kind of government and CEOs fall towards the bottom of the chart. Um, and I think social's had a massive part of that. We've seen um, the evolution of uh, uh, the interactive marketing model that Amazon take. You bought this, your friends also bought that in terms of that, that, that pureness. So, so there's a couple of factors. One is which that, uh, you know, social has grown up so much that it's really hard to hide and, and organizations are being voluntarily more transparent because you know society's changed to make us more transparent um, so I, and I think that um, uh, trend if you like has kind of evolved now to uh, um, enabling businesses and uh, governments to be much more open and respond to that in terms of policy making itself you've got the ability through neat digital tools to enable open policy making like never before. That kind of commentariat example that I showed um, of the ability to find the right people and market to them directly to or to reach out to them directly to get their opinion into things uh, are things that have really well happened in that space. Um, we've seen the advent very recently uh, in the UK, the launch of demsoc.org. Um, Yes, 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 yes. So um, they're championing open policy making. So I think we'll have seen a rise in either NGOs, um, non-government organizations, or organizations that get bright individuals together that care about that subject, that enable people to get together and collaborate. And that's one of the kind of latest evolutions I've seen in that. Thank you. Hi there. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned early that uh, starting from objectives is key. Uh, is that generally done? And how? how because as as a, as a just as a casual web user, you see Department X has a Flickr and Department Y has a Twitter, and it's not really apparent to to me as a as an outsider. How does that connect to? The, the goals that these yeah uh, sure it's, a, it's a really valid question and one of Thanks. the first things that I said is is uh, you know strategy and objectives are very important and some of the learnings that we have is that you know uh, uh, some of the times in which we started we had to evolve you know when I started with the um, uh, the team that was digital engagement there were three of us and the director so we kind of had to evolve policies and processes very quickly and actually we joined when departments had Twitter feeds already and we're using them quite well or some of them not as engaging as they could be so uh, you're absolutely right uh, everything should come from objectives hasn't always historically in every place um, you know some things have gone or grown organically the the web rationalization project of kind of pulling down 95 percent of government websites over five years certainly hadn't started strategically because the web happens and then everyone who had a policy or a brand or a department decided to have its own website. So we had to do an enormous amount of work uh, because it hadn't started strategically. I actually think organizations now that are planning their digital engagement, who are you know later adopters to it, have a huge advantage because they've seen everything that's gone before and they can do it strategically because where it started originally was organically. 
Um, and uh, I think you're absolutely right. Sometimes it's not apparent to the user. And the, the case that I use about Diffid in terms of what they do, our Department for uh, International Development has a very clear remit because uh, their strategy starts from the British public wanted to see where the money in international aid is spent. And it's very clear when you look at their social channels. They've got beautiful photo stories of, you know, the Bangalore town that they've rebuilt and things along those lines. But it's not the true in every case. I'm just saying it, it ought to be. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a pretty basic question. Uh, companies who allow people to comment can easily censor and take away un unpleasant comments and so on. But in pub when, you're in, uh, when you're a public authority, the situation is perhaps a bit different. You, you have to let people sort of get their voice heard, but at the same time, the balance of not offensive and all that. How do, uh, how do you deal with that? Sure. So it's about managing people's expectations when they come to the point of contact and the points that they want to leave comments. So um, I think now, um, going back to your earlier point that it's okay for companies to delete them but not so for public sector, I don't necessarily wholeheartedly agree with. I think lots of organisations now, as much as government, get criticised for deleting comments and showing things only in the fresh light. And it's considered in social media particularly incredibly bad practice uh, to delete comments that um, just don't put the company in a great light because it's kind of filtering that open information. It's okay to have a policy to say, if you swear on here, you know, this isn't the forum for that, we will delete your comments. But it's about managing people's expectations when they land on the, the site itself. If you allow open comments or at least even moderated comments, it's fair to say to the public what you will support and what you won't support at the point they leave their comments. Because if they leave a comment that transgresses your policy of what's acceptable on that site and you've not communicated that policy, then that person may feel disgruntled and come back to you. So just be very clear about that. Most organizations are um, uh, in terms of what they kind of upset. You can even have it on you know, your Facebook page or your you know, Twitter page. If it's not in the bio, you can easily capture it in the background about what kind of you know, uh, comments, particularly on Facebook and on your corporate moderation page, of what's the what, what are you using that for. In the case of uh, Twitter, obviously people can tweet whatever they like, but you might be able to say, if you've got a direct customer service inquiry, here's our number for customer services. So you can use that to signposting them to the right place for that. I hope that helps. It's a good question. Yes, hi, thank hi. you. Um, I was wondering um, just if you would speak a little bit uh, uh, on the drivers of this development and possibly also what could be constraining it because your examples show uh, very clearly that there are areas that could be made more efficient and perhaps more transparent and this all seems very good but what's actually driving that you spoke to it a little bit and what's actually hindering that development could you sure i could and i could take the story on a little bit further the uh, information that i presented is from my tenure in government which i spent eight out of the last 10 years um our government in the uk has gone through a, uh, a general election and a change of government and i i uh, uh, worked for our new coalition government into sort of one or two months um of the uh, you know new appointment if you like so i can talk about the drivers at the beginning of the agenda and all of the policies I've shared with you are kind of what, how we evolved because for the people that I've been speaking to uh, today and from knowing as much as I did about you before I was here, I thought that was the most pertinent drivers for you to be informed about or to research. What caused us to want to open up government um, you know, from uh, 2002 to where we are now are some things that you'll be going through as a government and process yourself. But then some other drivers happened. So we had a general election and we had a completely um, new government. We had a coalition government, which we haven't seen for a number of years. Um, we also had almost half new MPs. We had an MPs expenses debacle in the UK, um, which meant that um, almost half of our MPs resigned or, or weren't coming back into their post. So whoever... Uh, was the new um, leaders within government, we knew we'd have completely new people. And we knew that they'd perhaps have different expectations. So we had to do kind of skills mapping of what competencies we had in case they came in on day one and said, 
we need a YouTube channel and why haven't you got a blog and what are you doing about Flickr? Um, so we needed to look at who had the right skills and how we map them. So there were different drivers there. And then, uh, then I guess what happened was um, the, we've seen the biggest public sector spending cuts we've ever had in the UK uh, since the Second World War. And um, it froze the digital ag agenda for a short while while all of those cuts were embedded. So um, they then built up their digital team. They've got a cracking great digital engagement director, Mike Bracken, who used to be um, tech director of The Guardian, and put together the new government digital service. They launched gov.uk just about three months ago, which is the evolution of direct gov. You go, you go to uh, what grew into a kind of a monolithic website over six or seven years. They've now cut that to a, a much more elegant effete version. So the, che the drivers that you're asking for have changed significantly over time. And in terms of where they are right now, um, They've looked at digital engagement, you know, over the last, you know, five, six, seven years of which we've been doing it. Um, and now they're looking at a much more linear execution, uh, a much way of doing things through community partners and um, looking at the ways in which they can just kind of facilitate and enable kind of key stakeholders um, and people to get together to solve issues themselves with uh, listener support from government is one of the more recent changes. I hope that addresses some of your question. The dro the board of the drivers are, you know, has changed significantly over time. Thanks. Hi, I'm Anna Kian. I, I work in transmedia, and one of the things we see is often our users do not do what we expect them to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and one thing I'm thinking about here, uh, which is great to give the citizen idea that their voice matters, but then in one and we all have very politically diverse opinions and about what we think should do, so you can't satisfy all of them. Yes. Are there risk of a backlash when you give them this impression that you have a say, but then they don't get what they want? So, Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, but not pleasing all of the people all of the time. <laughs> yeah, because you can't, right? And, yes. you, and, and bottom line, and you give them a sense of that their voice is matters and is heard, but you can't satisfy yes. all those voices. And yeah. it, so it, a part of that is management of expectations. Um, and it's not to limit, you know, their expectations, but uh, take open consultations, which is when you're asking them to have the say the most. When we started open consultations, we, you know, it was it was trying to get everyone's opinion together, trying to crunch that down, trying to make policy making, and then we kind of got pilloried because we weren't telling people how we use their opinion. So we learned from that and we grew our processes because of that. And one of the things that we do know in central government in terms of policy making is make sure that when we're doing any consultation project from the very outset, we tell people what's the time frame, not just of the consultation, which has got to be very clear for a deadline, but the time frame in which we'll respond. Um, uh, and produce the green paper or the white paper, which are the precursors to kind of law that get laid in Parliament, but also what we will and won't respond to. So we sometimes say overtly, we are not going to respond to every individual inqui inquiry, but we will uh, precy or summary um, the process that we went through or the opinions. Now, in the case of, which was quite unusual, I think, the case of um, the MPs' expenses, um, we made a commitment to publish every single response, and we did. Um, so one way of getting around that, so people saying, did they read my opinion, did they take it into account, was to basically unpersonalize it so that people didn't know uh, the public looking at the information, who had sent that query. But we published every single um, response that had come into that consultation um, so that people could look at that dropped it into a spreadsheet, kind of grouped similar ones together so people could see the volume. Because actually that changed the way in which MPs' expenses were then managed and it created the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority in terms of um, you know, the new body that now allows uh, uh, the, the organisation of MPs' expenses. So there are ways in which it can be managed. You aren't always going to have some people who... <laughs> because of their opinion, it wasn't taken on board, are going to be disgruntled by that very fact. You can minimise the fallout by being very clear or publishing everything. Thanks. Good question. Hi there. Hi. Um, would you like to share a, uh, a little bit about your, your favourite tools and the tools that you, you, you feel you couldn't do without? Okay, uh, in terms of uh, well, uh, in terms listening of and engagement tools. the work that you're tools. doing in, in, uh, with, the, with all the data and you know, some of the things that you, know, you feel that uh, have maybe changed the way you work or provided you with some 
little piece of gold. Sure, sure. I I could do an entire day on this and sometimes have though. Tools, tools. Um, when we started, tools weren't that sophisticated, especially the monitoring medium. So there's a payoff. There's a payoff between free tools, very easy to use, give you unfiltered information that isn't very useful. To go to medium tools in terms of medium size of pay for them, a little bit more filtered the information you're looking for, to kind of the real heavyweights in terms of very expensive tools, very hard to set up. You need coaching and training. You have to go through the, that kind of curve of learning massively useful um, and ways in which that you they can save you time uh, over time but they take a lot of learning and configuration and they're quite sophisticated sometimes a sledgehammer to crack a nut um, because you don't need that much some of the lighter tools would do so in the free space I use iGoogle I have three four different pages of iGoogle open every day um, that I switch between in the, my backdrop I've got Wikipedia and Theosaurus and and as well as kind of you know the news that comes out of the Guardian uh, within that. My uh, two uh, Twitter management tools that I most prefer in the free p uh, space are Hootsuite, um, which enables me to filter Twitter in really meaningful ways. I follow 900 people. I can't listen to what they're all saying. I segment them into clients, people I want to work with, sources of information, um, you know, friends, so that I can see um, uh, what is the conversation. And I can also post from that, and I work a couple of different accounts um, and post from that. There's a new tool that digital strategists in the UK are using um, that is incredibly useful for Twitter. It's called Social Bro, and it tells you the best time of the day to tweet according to when your audience is actually online um, and does some really smart ways of, uh, of looking at uh, ranking your followers by social influence to get different messages out. So that's the kind of you know free space. They're quite interesting. Um, I don't really play very much in the medium space because I either use free tools and help clients set up free tools. I use a lot of the heavyweight tools. Um, but in the medium range, you have things like SM2, Meltwater Buzz, Uberview are all kind of really good tools. If you are selling reports to clients, Uberview is a great way and a pretty way of doing uh, social media data analysis and producing automated reports. Um, we consider the top three tools on the market in the UK um, by popularity um, in terms of the people that are using them and the sophistication to be Brandwatch, Radian 6 and Sysamos. They're the kind of heavyweight management tools. Um, I have a preference for Sysamos out of all of those three. It, um, it turned out to be 84% accurate in sentiment analysis, which is the top of those three tools on the market. Um, and uh, it is a very sophisticated tool. And I could talk to you all day about tools, but that's my, that that's the range, I think, in, in kind of the tools that I can't do without. Last night, I, I was um, speaking, uh, it's Internet Week Europe, and I was speaking um, in London, and a tool uh, was demonstrated to us, which I will share with you. It's called Flockler, flockler.com. Um, we created a magazine live by using this publishing tool, Flockler, but is the only tool I've ever seen that automatically publishes it into an iPad-friendly format. So we created a magazine in five minutes and then showed the audience. It was for a charity. We were kind of working on social application for them for a live event and then showed them the magazine that we've created. Uh, and it's not one of my tool set yet because I haven't used it enough, but I imagine I'll be using it quite a lot. I think they're great. And, and very young and just on the market. So an interesting thing. Thank you. Hi. Uh, for how long do you keep the data available? Uh, because I, I guess it's fairly new, so you don't have so much archives. But for how long can people search uh, back into the data that you're collecting or uh, how far ahead are you planning to keep that data available? Sure. It's, it's a really good question that I don't know the answer to because I, I no longer work directly for central government. I sometimes advise them. Before I came here to speak to you, I had a conversation with the head of digital engagement number 10 and said, what's new? What can I tell uh, the people of Malmo about what you guys are up to right now? So I don't know how long they keep the data. But also, because we've gone through a coalition government, um, uh, they archived 
a lot of uh, information. The links that I've given you in this presentation um, will say this has been archived in the national web because it was um, either a degree of political or outdated. They, they, they shelved a lot, but what we did is capture, so kind of um, make sure that the links were live and capture the journeys, but archived a lot of the content. So I, I don't know how long they keep it for now, and I don't know what the legal terminology that is. And I imagine it's different uh, for different endeavors. It's not something I uh, not something I know the answer to. Uh, Tiffany, if I could sneak in another question, it's sure. uh, one of so those something questions. Something that I do know the answer to. It'd be great Good. to end on. <laughs> it, it's one of those questions motivated by those of us who find it really difficult not to remain somewhat suspicious and anxious about what these things might mean, and that is that uh, in the interest of transparency, we're depending upon the work of code, which operates in a very untransparent way. And so, what's often uh, curious is that with every electronic interaction that is being um, engaged here, there's also a record of that transaction, and that's organized and maintained by the algorithms that is embedded in code. And there's a great opportunity for that to then to be collected, re-aggregated, people then get profiled and retargeted in ways they can't be aware of because we don't have access, given the proprietary nature of code, to exactly how it's operating. So there's a paradox here between the privacy of code and the transparency of its operations. Could you say something a little bit about privacy protection in such an arena? Um, yes, I can say lots about it. Again, um, a very interesting question too. And um, you can take privacy in certain contexts. So I don't know, has anyone here seen recently, you know, the search for something on Google and then those ads will follow them around the web? Have you kind of, you know, seen a little bit about it? Yeah. And, and d is that relevant or is that not relevant in terms of what you're looking for? Sometimes or sometimes not? <laughs> yeah, most people find that creepy. That's yeah. the kind of things that you're talking about here, I think, in terms of the application for, for people. You'll search for something, yeah, you know, it'll store your cookies, it'll uh, serve up information and content to you. So there's a couple of evolution in, pr uh, in uh, privacy privacy that isn't on a legislation base. So, you know, with the advent of social networks, people started posting things that they wanted to on Facebook, and then one day Facebook decided they owned all of your photographs. And there was a huge public outcry about that. They changed their policy. Policies um, and something since. Some of the things that you, uh, some of the things that came to mind when you mentioned is that you know you're surfing for something, you find a neat app that you like, you just press, um, you know, accept. You don't read the 24 pages of conditions that they have, and they have access to your data that you probably haven't considered. They have access to post on your Facebook page on behalf of you if they feel like it, if you haven't kind of deselected that. And sometimes you can't buy that neat app that you like because of the way in which that you haven't got the choice to accept it or not accept it. You accept it and they do what you like with your data um, or you don't accept it. And, um, and it's a huge debate at the moment because there's not enough, uh, where people are now smarter um, in ha their privacy use of social networks where they weren't before. So people use social networks, particularly Facebook, in a very open manner and then became very aware because of kind of public um, uh, news stories around um, you know, what was happening with their information and who owned it, um, locked down. We're now in the kind of next stage. So our information is being taken and things are being done with it that we don't imagine we've signed up to, but yet have always press that accept button um, in terms of how it is. And there will be an evolution of how we, two or three things will happen with that, I imagine, is that um, people get such smarter about how they use um, as they've gone through the learnings with you know, Facebook and social networks, they'll get much smarter about how they use and accept in terms of data is one uh, possible option in this. The second thing is that if it's buried in code and things that people don't understand, the reason I think that's a, an evolution, um, uh, working for the kind of developers network, the kind of um, uh, principles of code um, for people um, uh, learning uh, and the way in which they learn now is that code to us might seem something that we would never learn to be able to do or take up. Um, and might sit somewhere in, that's my web developers and that's my techies and that's people who do that. There's, there's a school of thought that, that coding is actually a 21st century media literacy and um, uh, uh, younger people will get to learn uh, to code in a way that uh, we use technology um, in lighter ways. So, 
uh, one of the avenues of thought in terms of the privacy debate um, is that people get smarter. As we've evolved through social media in our use of privacy, people get smarter in the way of privacy. The second is that um, as social media has put pressure onto individuals and organizations, uh, as social media has put pressure onto organizations to be more transparent, um, society has changed. Uh, to become more transparent because the facility of social media has enabled that to happen. The gentleman's question that companies can delete you know, um, comments that they don't like means that actually that's not really acceptable practice and many don't. So society has grown up to say that actually in the evolution of privacy is not a great thing to sneak terms and conditions past your clients and sign up and do things into their data. And the third evolution is the kind of, you know, the, the, the stuff that we don't really want to contemplate, that this will grow and we will give away our data. And you'll have people who don't care about that because they want to use the apps, they'll get served direct marketing in ways that they don't like electronically, or people will step off the grid and start to um, uh, meter and shut down um, the way in which they act and engage digitally and kind of the backlash against it. Is the schools of thought I've heard on it, but a really interesting question. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> when it comes to citizens engaged uh, kind of policy making, uh, is there a risk for populism taking over and uh, and how is it uh, how is it communicated in what way policy is being made not only how you kind of report back uh, that you've read it or this and that but because uh, democracy has to balance between what the majority wants and minority needs sure so how is that kind of both communicated and uh, how was that dealt with on a policy level? Yeah, sure. Um, and I don't have uh, the generic answer to that because different policies are made by different government departments. And although there's uh, uh, overarching processes about how they do each consultation, each will be reined in by different budgets, um, by different uh, interests. If you're doing something on massive healthcare changes, that's going to affect far more people. If you're doing the cost, quality, and usage of government websites, you know, you could argue that's as important to everyone, just not everyone is as interested in it because it's not going to perhaps affect them as personally. So the policy changes and the open democracy, um, there's not necessarily one strategy that you are working in a government department as a, as a you, uh, you're just doing consultation, it doesn't matter your subject matter, there's the same process that doesn't exist. There's different processes depending on the context of it. And I, I, I don't know whether that's right or wrong, but that's just just what has happened historically up to the end of my tenure in 2010. So some of the answer, the things that we were discussing earlier, um, kind of on this side of the room, which are around the fact that you have to ensure that your policy making gets out in a face-to-face -face environment or is publishable in an in a offline environment where the people that are affected and concerned by that policy have the opportunity um, to comment on it, okay, not just in a digital way. So we do as much as we can or historically have done as much as we can to solve the populism issue of just getting the digitally engaged. And then the second area is demsoc.org, as, uh, as we were talking about, is the organisations that um, are, are set up to look at how we can be better at this and help to them lobby or put pressure on government or advise them on better ways to be able to do it. Th there's not one answer to that. Yes, yes, how you make the policy. Yeah, the, and, the, and the same goes um, for uh, the waiting. So I've, I've worked within government teams where we've made policies. I've made three policies, been part of pr three policy teams that we've made policies that have changed 
um, government policy from public opinion. Um, uh, uh, those three have been the national pensions debate, um, Dame Carol Black's uh, state of the British uh, uh, health workforce. So it's about when people go on long-term sick, how you, can you minimise that or encourage um, you know, getting back into a working environment. And then the third has been the MPs I expenses consultation. So I've, I've personally worked on all three and um, some of them pre-digital and some of them post-digital in terms of the processes and the systems to not just do the communication piece, but actually, you know, kind of crunching the policy that comes back to that. So if it was 100,000 people responding and 10,000 people with special needs, those special needs voices would be heard because of the way in which the consultation responses are structured to enable them to understand that those, those people are the ones with the needs to be served. But there's not like I say, one rule that I can stand here and say, oh, well, that's easy, you do A, B, and C. It's not easy, it's not easy, but um, it, it is worked through in a, in a manner that serves the best public interest on this. But it's not always just the opinion of the public. So, uh, so it's a push and pull. So the government have some objectives to make some changes, um, uh, which is why they're consulting, and the public have the right to give their opinion. The uh, uh, the way in which policy making is then formed, because 100,000 people say something and 10, 000, uh, 10, just 10 people say something, they don't necessarily ensure that all of those are taken in. They have to meet the, what the government want and what the public want halfway to make that new policy happen um, in that regard. And I think it's worth you know, stating that, obviously. Thank you. Okay, thank you first for your impressive speech. I don't know if my question is really pertinent to this topic because we are living actually in a, a digital gap, I mean, because what we're talking about are all happening in the liberal democracy, but for people living in China, for example, uh, or uh, YouTube, Twitter, and uh, all those kind of social networks was actually blocked. And recently in this week, all the Google services was blocked because we are in a once in a decade uh, political power transition. So uh, the thing in China is that people want to get involved in the citizen engagement, but the government is always trying to keep you at distance. So from your uh, perspective and uh, these circumstances, what we can do? So that's my question. Thank it's, you. A, it's a very interesting question that again, I, I don't have all the answers to because you know I've been working in an environment where we're very lucky that we've got the opportunity to engage with the public and have the public engage with us. Um, I've, I've recently, my most recent experience in terms of um, you know uh, government that are going through change or those channels aren't open uh, uh, and able to them in uh, 2011, I spoke to the Serbian government. I work a little bit with the Australian government, the Flemish government. I work with. Um, uh, uh, went to speak at them with the Serbian government. So they'd just gone through a period of change where they were looking at that uh, civic engagement's all very well, please come and tell us about it. Um, but the questions that I got back were very similar to the question you were asking me. Very well, Tiffany, we're not allowed to do it in this country. We're not, we don't have access to these channels because they're restricted at country level or um, there aren't the open channels into government um, in terms of policy making. Our government might not be interested in, in taking those questions. Really, really similar questions of which there are no easy answer because you, you know, um, do you go outside um, your walled garden to get into international debate, to put leverage, you know, is that seen as, uh, you, know, uh, you know, personally risky or professionally risky in terms of what you're doing? Uh, you know, I, I know that there's some great facilities in China like uh, Sino Web, um, which is a fantastic Twitter and microblogging service that um, you're not able to have Twitter and Facebook, but you have that as a facility. So you, ha you do have um, some social platforms and social networks of ways in which you communicate. In terms of how you then communicate an open policy and open democracy uh, with your country is another issue that I don't understand enough about China to give you a, a kind of full and open response. So a, uh, it's a very interesting question. It's something I'm not going to be able to resolve here for you today. Thanks. We have uh, sadly only time for one more question, but uh, just so you know that it needn't be the end, uh, Tiffany, despite being um, rigorously overworked all day, has kindly uh, allowed herself to be available for <laughs> some lingering and, and per perhaps I'm more personal lingering. points of discussion uh, <laughs> afterwards. So don't uh, let this be uh, the close, but uh, perhaps the last public opportunity for a question. One last question? Anyone? 
Can I, can I say, I'm delighted by these questions. Not only are they intelligently thought through, but there's nothing worse than kind of saying, this, this is what we've done with no questions at all. But um, really interesting things and uh, it made me think uh, more about some of the work that I've done. So thank you. Thank you very much again. Uh, with, all, with all the uh, social media and technology uh, opening up the transparency, the flow of information and so on, there is also a contradictory trend, really. Uh, a bit of the Amazon uh, allegory you did before, where we tend to tribe up with people who think like us. You follow this, uh, the same people uh, on Twitter with the same mindset and, and views of the world. Uh, you, uh, work with your f uh, you, you work with your friends on Facebook and so on. And we have, with the transparency, we have the ability to sort of shut our, out the reality around us and keep uh, and, and find people who are more like us than we ever could find before. Uh, and thinking of the U.S. election, well, if you vote for one party, you watch Fox News, and if you vote for the others, uh, you 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 read Hun uh, Huffington Post, for example. But is there any way around that? to try to sort of push transparency, uh, uh, help people not to shut out? It's, it's a really interesting question because I've seen one or two endeavors towards that, but I've seen, and tools that facilitate that, but not many in uh, the contrary. So the, the things that I've seen towards that, that uh, supporting your um, position, if you like that, you know, we tend to group together, is that, um, you know, the facilities on Facebook is that you have a group of friends, but it's actually only the ones that you're most engaged with will uh, surface your posts in their news feed, for example. So you may or may not be aware of that, but, uh, you know, that's a kind of automated filtering that you don't have any control over, you know. And there's um, a thinker and a speaker in the stateside market called Peter Shankman, and he talks about that in the future, our offline and online relationships will be reflected by not, you know, unfriending people or unfollowing people. They'll just filter out the less we are engaged with them because that privacy that we were talking about in the coding will surface people within our own community that we're more frequently engaged with in our social space, as with our news. So I've seen tools already start to form that, and I've seen um, social networks already uh, make steps towards that. But actually, what is the facility here that we have about um, ensuring that we have a wider vision of content and we had a wider vision of friends? The... Um, the analogy that's that's up for debate on this, um, I'm sure uh, most of you will have heard of the Dunbar number, around, I think it's 150, and Coke can go up to 250, of the, the accepted fact of the ancestral village, which states that, you know, the number... Um, uh, of around 100 to, uh, 150 is about the most amount of relationships that we can accept, um, that uh, we have the headspace to know of, and it's the size of the ancestral um, village. And the debate is, um, with the way uh, we've grown up, with the way that we work around the world, with the, with the way that we go to university with someone and we might go and live in another town, has social media enabled the connections between people um, uh, to, to, to happen because we're spread all over the world? Has social media enabled that? Or did we create <laughs> social media to keep our um, ancestral village number of 150, even though they might be in Australia. Um, so um, to answer um, uh, your question, which I'm not sure I'm able to, we, we still have the average number of connections on Facebook is still around 150 and people have more or less. So is it the fact that we uh, are not tailoring and filtering the people we engage with? It's just that we connect with them in social spaces because the way that the world has moved and changed means that they're not physically located as near to us to be able to see face to face. So there's an argument that your proposition isn't perhaps true, is one, is one kind of case and argument, that we still have 150 people. We had 150 people 2,000 years ago and we've still got 150 people now. It's just that they're friends on Facebook because we can't see them as easily because they're in, they're in you know, another country. 
Um, I don't yet know of any tools that are in development that kind of um, uh, uh, break uh, and uh, the uh, opportunity for you just to follow like-minded people. The only one that I can think of has taken steps in evolution towards that is Path. When Path started, it was a direct backlash to you sharing everything in a large group of friends on Facebook. Path was a photo sharing site best enabled for mobile that restricted you when it started to just 50 friends because it only wanted you to be able to share photos with your immediate friends. I think they've gone that up to 150 now, but they've certainly cut that number that you cannot connect more than with more than that group of people. Um, it's the only tool that I've seen across that I is uh, has made steps towards, I think, your proposition. But I think that's... I'm going to go away and look at that. What an interesting concept. Thank you very much. Uh, 